our final guest has his fingerprints on a surprising number of distinctive places in Metro Vancouver, though his name necess isn't necessarily on them. The Wall Center, the Aberdeen Mall, the Surrey Center, among many others. He was chief designer for Bing Tom, working on projects around the world. Throughout his remarkable career, he takes breaks and travels or immerses himself in study. He's just returned from obtaining his la latest degree at one of the most prestigious architectural institutes in London. There, he focused on architecture at its absolutely broadest multidisciplinary definition. And here to share some insights he gained, please welcome Chris Doré. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, Lynn, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's talks. So um, I want to start the first story. Um, summer of 1988, after my undergraduate studies, I stepped into a London phone booth to dial my first 604 number, which was to be my phone interview for a job in Canada. My boss-to-be asked, which school of architecture had I studied in? What was my final thesis about? What was my ability to put a building together? Had I traveled to Europe while studying in the UK? Which was my favorite city and why? Had I been to Liverpool to visit the cathedral? Naturally, he was from Liverpool. <laughs> I arrived in Vancouver that fall with a student overdraft of 5,000 pounds, but I didn't care, because I got the job. Now, three decades later, this is the second story. In a slightly different scenario, I receive a text message from two of my brightest students, who I taught um, two years ago. Both had traveled to Japan after completing their grad school. They were calling me or they're texting me from Tokyo. And having been there for two months doing an unpaid internship with Shiguru Ban, was, were considering the option of working in Vancouver again. Sadly, not being in a position to offer them a job again, I wrote an email to a senior colleague in the industry singing praises about these two young talented graduates I received a reply. Hi, Chris. Nice to hear from you. And yes, we are very busy, but we need to know if they can work with Revit. <laughs> I've been troubled and bothered by this, about how marginalized this profession had become. Its loss of empathy and the lack of emotional intelligence which is why in the fall of 2016, I decided to go on sabbatical to unlearn in order to re-educate myself with what is happening to us and to better equip myself with an answer so that I can assist young creative minds like these who have to deal with a very different scenario in order to get ahead in their careers than I did 30 years ago. Okay. Last spring, um, while I was doing my postgraduate, I attended a book launch at the AA when both Beatrice Colomina and Mark Wigley began their presentation by bombarding the attendees with a very ancient question. Are we human? Within minutes, this oldest question of all triggered a chain of parallel questions. What is human? When did we become human? Are we still human? Were we ever human? And are we human yet? <laughs> the human might be the only species that questions itself. Even a machine might ask if it is human. And as we know, some machines are more human than humans. Aren't we increasingly being asked by machines to demonstrate that we are humans? The constant labor of proving that you are yourself with passwords and biometrics 
offers a thin and fragile defense against this traumatic tread of identity theft, which on a positive note only confirms that we are not totally machines yet. Technology in its current state allows the human species to extend beyond its functional and empirical properties and in, into the mental and existential spheres of life. Today we find ourselves mediating between the world and our consciousness by internalizing the world and externalizing our minds. This is where I take a massive turn towards computation as a human condition and argue that there is a direct correlation between the death or the I be more subtle, the end of theory and the rise of software where the later replaces the former as a tool of thought. Software no longer just describes things or makes things, but things true it. Is this the new genesis of our species? Is it how we mediate the world and are mediated by it? Or we become what we are by making what in turn makes us? Marshall McLuhan once said, the most human thing about us is our technology. <laughs> With this one poetic statement, he captured the tension in humankind's relationship to technology. He identifies the technology as an extension of ourselves, increasing our capabilities while also increasing our anxieties by destabilizing our conception on what it means to be human. In my graduate school, I was privileged enough to meet Starlock, a performing artist, in a cybernetics conference in Glasgow, when he performed this project called Ping Body, where signals from the internet were converted into electrical signals that involuntarily moved his muscles. His entire body became a barometer of internet activity. He experimented with exoskeletons to explore hybrid forms of movement through networked technologies to augment human abilities through the use of prosthetics. Encyclopedia Britannica defines a robot as any automatically operated machine that replaces human effort. In other words, in contemporary definition, Almost everything and anything within my sightline is a robot. The monitor before me that is translating my non-symbolic thoughts into digital symbolic thoughts is a robot. My magic keyboard and mouse are robots. My oven is a robot. My thermostat is a robot. My smartphone is a robot, and yes, these pair of wireless airports are definitely my tiniest robots. Come to think of it, I am a robot with my self-extended apparatus completing my chores on my command. I have become one with my technical objects. Did this move here? In this technical, Era. What I mean by becoming one is the digital media that gradually gains complete authority over us by controlling and neutralizing the maximum number of existential uh, refrains, thereby moderating the limited limits within which we cogitate, sense, and perceive. We do not get out too much. We tend to think that everyone is thinking just like us, feel the same way as everyone else does, and this strange passivity haunts our daily lives. What is apparent in all of these processes is these technological interventions are effectively modifying our subjectivity at deeper and deeper levels until we have become systemized to a universal code of behavioral patterns that makes us all alike. 
Since the Albertan era, 15th century, the body was an organism we inhabited. But today, we speak more broadly as the body is no longer a physical structure. It is a form of a virtual body composed of numerous agents of people, things, concepts, or processes using the networked eye to extend one's self. So what is this self? This self tries to establish a more dynamic relationship between technology and nature. There is a compiling evidence that this technology is rapidly progressing at an exponential rate in the terrain of wet software through the emergence of biological and non-biological intelligence. What would space be then with the absence of material science, which fundamentally aided the industrial processes, making possible the built environment we inhabited for centuries over? I believe when the technological singularity arrives in due course, computing technology will become our second nature, and it will determine a total rethink of our symbolic relationship to humans, and perhaps we will start viewing technological interventions as living systems. So what is the imbalance to this storyline so far? The Industrial Revolution automated manual work. The information revolution automated mental work, but machine learning automates automation itself. By taking automation to new heights, the machine learning revolution will cause extensive economic and social changes, just as the internet, the personal computer, the automobile, and the steam engine did in its time. Today, there seems to be hardly any era, area of human endeavor untouched by machine learning. Can machine learning become, remain invisible and independent of human bodies? The cloud could be seen as that form of embodiment, permanently generating signals and thus creating a vaporized topology of learning opportunities at an immeasurable capacity. Machine learning as we know it now does already exist in sensory environment made up of mobile phones, wireless headsets, smart watches, smart homes, internet, interconnected automobiles, and the list goes on and on. Machine learning's lack of body will gradually cease to be an issue. And a new super artificial intelligence will rise out of this coexistence of senses, materials, and environments made possible by big data in which the human body functions merely as an impulse generating transit station. I would like to end in <laughs> Douglas Copeland's own words, we all saw this coming. Thank you. <laughs>